Yeah. That, 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 that don't kill me can only make me stronger. I need you to hurry up now, cause I can't wait much longer. I know I got to be right now, cause I can't get much stronger. Warning, trigger. If you have been sexually abused, or you feel that this video is going to trigger you because it is going to go into some sexual detail of abuse, please do not watch this video. It is a trigger video. God is blessed. God is blessed, everyone. Um, as I said, this is a trigger warning video. Um, I will be talking about my sexual abuse. I already did a video on this. Below will be the link. That video was over an hour long and it goes into a lot more detail. If you want to watch that video, um, it is, it, well, it's a pretty powerful video, um, but you can watch it if you want. Um, this one I'm going to try to break down to at least a 10 minute video or 11 minute video. Uh, so I was sexually abused and raped and emotionally abused and physically abused from 6 to 12 years old by my grandfather on my dad's side. Now, he would start out by molesting me when I was younger. And then it became wasn't enough for him. And my grandmother would actually witness this and watch it. And, um, she would tell him sometimes to, um, first of all, I had a, uh, bedroom. Um, my parents were separated. So, when I was visit, this is what would happen. Um, he had a room that he called my room. And that's where all the sexual abuse happened, mainly all of it. So, um, one day, that's where he molested me. So one day, my grandma actually told him to take me into the room and show him what a man does. And she watched him as he raped me. And over time, there was techniques that he used because my dad was schizophrenic. Um, but he would mainly only do these when my dad was not in well. You know, whenever my dad went to the store or something else, or he would send him out for something. Or during, um let's say my fears are thunderstorms and tubs and even washing my head. The reason behind this is during thunder strikes or thunderstorms he would have sex with, you know, wake me because the thunder would cover the sound. And also the other thing is he would get in the bathroom the bathtub with me and he would dunk my head on the water. So if I would say anything or try to scream, I would choke. So um, I did later on try to resist later on down the road when I got bigger. But then I got physically beat up. Uh, he would never leave marks on my face. Now, the thing is that my grandfather was very rich. The whole cut family is very rich. And um, my grandfather wa uh, was president of the Ford Motor Company branch of, North Cal of um, Norfolk, Virginia for many years. So we know that he got a pension and he was very rich. He always carried wands of $100 bills. So after he would um, wait me or whatever, he would give me a $100 bill. So, in a way, after when he would tell my mom, that's what he would do. And he had these parties. Like, well, first of all, I don't know how to deal with this. Oh, my man, I'm trying to think what's best. Okay, first of all, in this special room, the one day, like, after I tried to fight him, um, he actually went to my room. Now, as a kid, this gun looked to me like a Desert Eagle, like a huge gun that he pulled out in my room beside my dresser that I never knew it was there. And then he put a clip in. Now, I remember the gun having like a shiny part on the side. So I think it was like a diamond plated or something like that. But as a child, you know, that can be different. But for some reason, I do remember that. 
the reason why is, sorry, that's my cat, Hawk Elise. Um, the reason why is he put that gun to my forehead and told me to get on the ground on my knees and he made me do sexual acts towards him. Now you can only imagine being a child and having a gun on your head to your head to do stuff. And the other thing is he would ha he was a serial pedophile because he would have children come to parties, male and female, and he would take them into um, the house when everyone's outside. And 10, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, they would come back out crying and he would give them a hundred dollar bill. So my symptom right there is that he literally was paying them not to say anything. So using my friendship, we'll go to how sadistic this is. It's first of all, my mom and me didn't have very much money and um, whenever I needed to go to a doctor, my grandfather took me to the doctors. And when the doctors would examine me or that there was questions, somehow they would rule it out as everything's okay, there's no, nothing happening, um, stuff like that. Um, I'll go in more detail if you watch my original video. But he would give them a what? He would give them a huge wad of hundred dollar bills. So basically he was paying off the doctors not to say anything. So um, the second thing is the way he scared me so bad was during thunderstorms again or rainstorms he would come to my room where I lived with my mom at the time um, and he would take a knife and like slid it across his throat like that. He always told me when he waked me that if I ever said anything, he would kill my mom. So on those days, those nights, he would take that and you can only imagine how scary it is to have a knife tapped on your window as a kid and then have someone do that. And that brings me to the point of the parties that he would hold. One time he had me and my best friend at the time, when I was very young, when I was probably around eight or so, come to a party and he had us get in the room and he pointed that gun, got that gun out in my room and pointed it at the kid and told him to strip and do what he wanted him to do. He wanted me to watch him while he did this act to the set of boy. And he pointed the gun at him and said, if you kill, if you resist or say anything, I will kill your friend Jesse here. Jesse, if you say anything towards him, anything about this, I will kill your model. So, of course, you know, it happened and I felt bad about that. I don't remember much recall of that, but that's what I do remember. And okay, and then we move on to... When I did tell my dad, again, he was schizophrenic, I told him this was happening for jam. Um, I was nine years old, so I told him, and he got very irate. When my grandfather pulled up, he broke out all the windows with his bare fist trying to kill him, chasing him around the house. I ran into his bedroom and locked the door. Now, my grandmother called the police. The police came, and we're talking about the 80s here or the popular 80s and um back then they didn't look they kind of didn't believe people with mental illness and also children they were they were different with they wouldn't really believe the child much back in the 80s so what happened was he told them that my dad was schizophrenic and he had no idea what he was doing he was off his medication so in this point of that, they believed it and um, they said, okay, so well, we're going to check in with his son. And what happened was this would never happen today. They opened up the door and the police officers were standing in front of me, but my grandfather was standing behind them. And then when they asked me, did anything ever happen to me? I said, 
um, no, because he was behind me and he went like this. And so it scared me and I said, no, nothing happened. So we're going to fast forward a little bit here because we went out of time. Um, that's how statistic he was in Virginia. Now, when I moved to Pennsylvania, he would come up and sometimes in the beginning he would come up the same day and take me back the same night. Which is a lot of driving from Virginia to uh, Pennsylvania. But anyhow, he would continue to do those acts in Virginia. But eventually he got too old and my grandmother was starting to get Alzheimer's. So in a way, um, um, by the way, what happened, I'm sorry, with my dad was he was highly medicated uh, the rest of his life. So my dad in these points is that he was innocent in this. I know you're going to say it's different, but when he was chasing him, he did say, you son of a bitch, you told me that you would never do to me what you did. You would never do it to my son. So that opens it up that questions. If you watch my earlier video about that, you will find out more about that. So anyhow, in uh, Pennsylvania, eventually, he decided to molest me and send my dad out for, you know, an errand or something. And it, it kind of slowed down because he got that phone because it, um, sorry about that phone going off. Um, basically it slowed down because of the molestation and me, not because of the molestation, because I was getting older. So it happened one more time in Norfolk, Virginia, and I fought back. And when he tried to touch me, when he fondled me, and I actually fought back that time, I was bigger, I was older, so I was able to take him down. He was younger, I mean getting older, I was younger. So anyhow, it stopped there. Now my mom had a lot of incidents with the hoe cuts. She said that she was almost killed three times because someone messed with her um, car and stuff and cut the brake lines, knew how to disassemble the, the, everything underneath of it so she would crash. This happened three times. She took it to a garage repairman and he said someone had their tampered with us, they knew what vehicles were, had to work vehicles. And that's all she would basically say, but she said there was a lot more stuff that they did, which gave her PTSD as well, dealing with them. So anyhow, in long short, when we did prosecute my grandfather, when I did tell my mother when I was 12 years old, is that he came in to Pennsylvania and he should have been prosecuted in all three states because it is federal law when you cross state lines. Um, sorry, this is 12 minutes right now. Um, in short, he came in with three piece attorneys and they said, um, like, like uh, I know, th three, four piece attorneys, three piece attorneys, and uh, two all one, and we didn't have very much money. So, of course, all he got was a slap on the wrist and put it on Megan's law. He didn't really do any time or anything. So, fast forward to. Uh, North Carolina, we found out that he was being involved in a church and that he was an assistant youth pastor. So I called North Carolina State Police. I reported that he was on Megan's list and what he's doing. And then I found out he stopped going to that church and he didn't attend it no more and he said he didn't like it. He, I think he, you know, opened pedophile with their children, of course. So anyhow, if you want to watch more of this video and you want to see the full hour video with detail, uh, please go to the link below and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell. God is blessed.